how things trickle into a page. CSS is moving toward. You don't have to do the math in JavaScript and then send that data yeah. over. Using JavaScript for a lot of these styling features is very much a hack. I get so much like positive energy from being able to create stuff. Companies don't have enough communication between designers and developers. Coding something and seeing it come to life is <laughs> so fun, which is why I like front end and like CSS yeah. specifically. I think accessibility is also a good analogy here. Like if you don't bake accessibility in from the start, it's really hard to make something work at the very end. Curious about the connection between developers and designers? Want to explore the rapid growth of CSS and the importance of front-end design? Join Una Kravitz, who leads the UI and tooling developer relations team at Google Chrome. As a member of the CSS working group, Una helps shape the future of web standards, focusing on making CSS HTML, and dev tools better for developers everywhere. And I'm Shashi Lo, Senior UX Engineer at Microsoft, here to help developers break into tech. Let's jump into the conversation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Shashi Lo, and this is Yuna Kravitz, and we're here to kind of just discuss about her journey and talk about CPFest. Uh, so, Yuna, I want to start off with just asking you about your journey as a DevRel at Google. Like, how did you start and what have you enjoyed so far? It's a long journey. <laughs> That's a funny question. I guess I've always really been into the intersection of design and development. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went into college, I decided to do a double major with computer science and graphic design, which was just the best mix that I could have possibly done at the time. I started out my career really being involved in the developer community. That's where I learned a lot about front-end development. That's where I first heard the term front-end development yeah. <laughs> that combined yeah. all of my interests. Um, and then I started working as a front-end developer really in the design space, like front of the front end. Mm -hmm. And throughout my career, I've been a UX developer, a UX engineer, um, front-end developer, job title. A director of product design was my last job title. And all throughout that time, I was experimenting with like weird things you could do in the browser with CSS, mm -hmm. writing blog posts about them, giving talks on the matter, uh, really like spending my free time, my weekends doing that. And then eventually, somebody from Google reached out and asked about this, you know, there was a job opening for design relations and material design. And that was really interesting to me because it was sort of like turning my hobby, the thing that I like to do into my day job. And um, I joined the Google team eventually moved over to the Chrome team working on web platform. And that was now five years ago I've been working oh, as awesome. a developer relations engineer at Google. That's awesome. Now, I know myself too. Like I found myself in the crossroads of designing websites and doing development and that front end development role didn't come to fruition for a while. It was like mm -hmm. web designer, web developer. How did you find yourself like gearing, moving towards more coding opposed to going down the design path? I think that I've always been really interested in the logical aspect of it. Like I loved computer science. I really loved like discrete structures and I would run the review sessions for my class. Like I enjoy that aspect of it. I also really love design. It's hard to sort of pick one or the other, but I feel like with front end, you can be in the space where you have the power to build things while also thinking about the aesthetic, you know, qualities, the user, how someone uses something. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're just creating, like being a creator. And that's what drew me to it. And I definitely do more code than design now. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just a product of the ecosystem. <laughs> you know, if you don't design for a while, you like lose touch a little yeah. bit there. I guess the same with code. Um, but I really just find so much interest. I get so much like positive energy from being able to create stuff. So like coding something and seeing it come to life. <laughs> so fun, which is why I like front end and like yeah. CSS specifically. Yeah, that's awesome. So speaking of that, like sometimes companies have processes where it's tough to include design, right? And so you have this like barrier between design and development. How important is it to like include both of them right along the feature process from the beginning to the end? I think it's really important. I, I feel that most companies don't have enough communication between designers and developers. And, you know, we talk about this like waterfall process that yeah. ends up happening, <laughs> which sucks because if you're not a part of the process from the beginning, you can really miss things. I think accessibility is also a good analogy here. Like if you don't bake accessibility in from the start, it's really hard to make something work at the very end. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's a problem that a lot of teams kind of have, you know, your design silo working in Figma and Photoshop, maybe like whatever tool you're using, Sketch. 
and then your developers take that and ingest it and just make something. It doesn't work in a responsive context. It doesn't work when you're trying to figure out the best way to go from the first screen to the second screen, mm -hmm. what happens in between. It doesn't work when CSS and UI is so far advanced from design tooling. Designers need to know what's possible mm -hmm. out there also with typography and color interactions and responsive design. There's not a great solution right now, but having both in the room helps to exchange ideas, it helps to introduce new concepts, it helps to upskill developers in the design space, like how to think about layout, typography, and white space. It helps designers know what's possible out there in terms of what's yeah. possible to code. So I think it's really important to bring these folks together more frequently and earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you speak like like it's your liaison between both of them, right? you're able to speak to design and speak design talk. And then from the flip side, you're able to understand the code and, and translate that to the developers because that communication itself is quite important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's a lot of things that are lost in translation, right? So speaking of that, like how important is that to communicate between the two different uh, departments? It's really important. You know, we talk about full stack developers, mm -hmm. right? Where, yeah. you know, you're connecting the front end to the back end and you're doing the whole Part of the process i feel the same thing with front end and design there is a really important skill to have which is that connection piece of what you can build what's possible but also pushing the boundaries a little bit with what you want to aesthetically create or not even aesthetics but user experience and accessibility like those are all really critical aspects of any user interface and the user interface is what differentiates your product. Like in this world now of AI, what's the thing that yeah. makes these companies different? If it's the same underlying value proposition is how easy it is to use your product, mm -hmm. how enjoyable it is to use it, how much it works in the user flow, things like that. Awesome. Now you're a CSS enthusiast. You know, I love your talks and everything you do with CSS. What are some features of CSS that are currently there or upcoming that you're looking forward to? Oh, there's a lot. So um, anchor positioning is one that I'm really holding close to my heart. It's, it's a feature that essentially lets you tether two elements together to create unique interfaces without having to require third party dependencies. So for example, you can create tree views, you can create dialogues that like uh, connect to buttons, you can create tooltips. Uh, sub menus like navigation menus, things like that, um, and then update those positions without any added scripting. You don't have to do resize observers, element observers, intersection observers, those sorts of things, all built into the browser. So that's a feature that I think is super powerful. I'm excited to see land. I'm also looking forward to scroll driven animations working across more browsers because that really brings a lot of fun, just touches. Yeah. to web experiences, like small things, even just how things trickle into a page without having to rely on additional scripting. Um, and there's a bunch of other features that are being worked on right now uh, around interactions like view transitions, yeah. which I think are also a great way to make the web feel very smooth. There's new color functions that let you oh, wow. set <laughs> contrast. There's upcoming features for how we interact with these layered UIs like mm -hmm. interest target. So yeah, if you ask me this question, I can just keep going. <laughs> well, speaking of that, like nowadays, JavaScript is so prominent, right? But CSS is making its way to eliminate some of that um, a dependency of JavaScript. Do you foresee that in the coming future that CSS is going to become more of a powerful tool so that you can have better performance, less JavaScript, easier to maintain and all of that? Because right now, to do certain things, you need JavaScript to mm -hmm. kind of detect things and, you know, work its way around to make sure that it does work with multiple browsers, devices, and all that stuff. I see CSS and HTML mm -hmm. becoming a lot more powerful. And I think the biggest reason why is because right now, using JavaScript for a lot of these styling features is very much a hack. Yeah. You should be yeah, able sure. to separate your logic from your styling. And I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. You should use JavaScript for anything that requires some kind of you know, state management or creative destructive action, anything that is logical for your interface, your state. If you need more data from the server, if you're updating server data, anything like that. With CSS and styling, that's where you should be styling things like dropdown, styling interactions and scroll, styling color values. It's just unfortunate that those features 
take time to build in natively. Mm -hmm. But now we have, you know, new things like tr actual trigonometric functions in CSS. You don't have to do the math in JavaScript and then send that data yeah. over. <laughs> um, so definitely getting a lot more powerful. This is why I like talking about CSS and UI, especially to JavaScript focused developers. They're just not keeping up with all the changes in the platform. And there's been so many over the past few years. I mean, that's true is I talk to a lot of junior developers and when I'm t I task them to do stuff, they go straight for JavaScript. Like they don't even figure out if there's capabilities in CSS to do what they're trying to achieve. If we can bring that awareness to more developers, then they can adhere to using CSS more opposed to going straight to JavaScript. And I think that is something that I love what, you know, you CSS enthusiasts are doing. I'm one myself, but I'm not like out there doing it. Yeah. But it really helps because like I, I always tell uh, other individuals that on a day to day, I don't have the opportunity to work on these brand new CSS uh, features, whereas you guys can do that. And it's like amazing to see because then I could take that, take those examples to bring it back to business and my managers to be like, hey, look at all those things we can do. And they always speak about performance and main maintainability. And that's exactly what I feel like CSS is moving towards is being able to create a way where we can depend less on JavaScript, mm -hmm. increase performance, but also being able to, you know, rely less and less on JavaScript. Yeah. And it really it's fewer hacks. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. So I wanted to move on to talk about C3 Fest. It's geared towards code, career and creativity. From what you've seen so far and, and all of that, how do you feel like it's going to be different from all the other tech conferences? I like this not focused just on like one developer community. It really tries to bring in a variety of different types of people that work in the tech space. Mm -hmm. So that includes, you know, designers more, but also people who focus on like career development specifically. That was interesting. I talked to somebody whose yeah. job it was to help with influence. You don't normally see at a developer conference. So I feel like that's something that we are missing in the space a little bit. Like when you have a React conference, you kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. With C3, it seems like there's a lot more variety in mm -hmm. what you're kind of exposed to, which is great. I saw one of your t Twitter videos of you like showcasing all your tech uh, badges. <laughs> and so you're definitely a person to speak about the variety of these conferences and whatnot. What do you hope to see from this conference? I know this is the first year that C3, the festival, it was created, but what do you hope to see from the future of C3? Well, it was actually really cool seeing the first talk, which was from the creator of Doom and mm -hmm. many other games. It was cool to like, kind of see the process and his thoughts about AI and like where that has a place or doesn't. <laughs> Mostly he was talking about how it doesn't really have a place. Yeah. So I hope to just kind of see more of that like behind the scenes. I hope to see more of people talking about the intersection of design and code. I hope to bring these people together. Like you asked about like bridging the gap between design and development. I think that there's still a lot of work to be done there. Mm -hmm. A lot of work to be done in the design tool space, in the dev tool space, in the communications and user space. I hope that events like this can help move the needle on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any advice or encouragement to those that are learning right now? Um, I know CSS is ever growing and more things are coming or new features coming and whatnot. Staying up with trends in technology is very difficult, right? It changes tomorrow. It's it, there's something new coming out. Yeah. I guess the advice I like to give to people who are entering the space is to start a blog, to start your own place in the internet. It's a place to be expressive, to create whatever you want because you fully own that content to sort of track. You know, you talked about things are changing. The trends are changing to track what's happening as it's happening to have an excuse to experiment with it and then post it somewhere, to start having a voice in the community. I think that that's a way to start to integrate more and uh, be less of an observer and more of an active participant in this space. Cool. Well, thank you, Yuna. Thank you for this interview. It was fantastic. And I hope to see more thank of you. Your, you know, speaking engagements and, and all of that as well. Thank you. This is great. <laughs>